Hello and welcome to this evening's internal medicine webinar. My name is Lydia Morgan and I'm commercial manager here at Virtual Veterinary Specialists. I'll be introducing our speaker for this evening, Professor Rob Fole, with his enlightening webinar on raw food and the research surrounding this diet. We really hope you enjoy tonight's webinar. VVS have a team of friendly and knowledgeable veterinary specialists who can support you with advice calls, written reports, radiology requests, or with our HALO service, our live guided specialist consultations. These include specialist live guided cardiology workups and live guided abdominal ultrasound with internal medicine review. If like me, you find both obtaining and interpreting cardiac images a little tricky, you may appreciate a cardiology specialist guiding you through. Well, I have good news for you. With VVS, you can have just that. Our diagnostic imaging team can also help you to image those hard to find adrenals and our internal medicine team can support you in establishing a suitable treatment and management plan for your patient following a VVS live guided abdominal ultrasound. This service can be possible in your practice through the installation of a VVS workstation with our sophisticated video sharing and diagnostic platform. If this is of interest, please do email us at info at vvs.vet or visit our website www.vvs.vet and we'd be happy to tell you more. Do also remember our advice calls and written reports can be accessed by any veterinary team. There's no need to register or subscribe and no equipment needed to access these services. VVS truly is an extension of your practice team. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Rob Fole, RCVS and European Specialist in Small Animal Internal Medicine. Rob became a recognised specialist in 2005. He joined Dick White Referrals in 2003, where he set up and ran the internal medicine and medical oncology services until 2016. He became a partner and clinical director at Dick White's for five years before leaving in December 2021. He's been involved in teaching at the University of Nottingham since 2008, and he's been a professor of small animal medicine at Nottingham since 2020. We're so lucky to have Rob on the VVS team bringing his wealth of experience and knowledge, as well as his care and compassion. If you have any questions as we go through the webinar, please add them to the chat box and we'll fin finish up the presentation with a question and answer session at the end. So with that, I'll hand over to Rob for tonight's talk on raw food. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Lydia, very much indeed for, the, for your introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome. Welcome to, to the webinar. Um, I hope you find this evening an informative uh, and enjoyable session um, uh, on what is definitely a, a challenging topic for us all. So um, here's the, the title, Raw Darts of Vegan Foods, The Solution to Everything or a Worrying Trend. Um, uh, and I say, I hope you find this interesting. So um, I think I ought to start by, by saying one thing formally, that um, I don't have any and have never had any relationship with any pet food manufacturer, be it conventional or raw feeding, uh, raw, raw food. OK, um, I've been in clinical practice all my life. Um, and uh, so I'm coming. I hope you're resident today. I'm coming to this topic with without a bias. Um, which is something I think is really, really important because there's clearly is a very impassioned topic where uh, with a lot of opinion. So I'm going to try to approach this in as neutral a fashion as I, as I possibly can. And the bulk of this evening, I'm going to talk about raw darts and uh, raw meat-based darts. But I'm probably going to use the term raw just as a, a, a to drop in. And if there is time, I have some slides on on vegan darts as well, which I'd love to cover. If we can but slightly different. And as Lydia said, very happy to take uh, any questions. Um, and I think uh, Lydia and Seth potentially could be, if there's a chat box as well, if there's, if you don't want to speak, then we can put the question in the chat box and uh, we'll pick those up at the end. Okay. So I don't think I need to tell you if you're in general practice or even actually in referral practice, um, the issue of raw food is becoming a really polarized debate. Um, I've just got some, some four quotes here from taken from the vet record in 2017 after a, a conference, um, within the BBA and, Mike, Mike Davis um, is the person I'm going to start with. Mike is an RCVS recognized specialist in clinical nutrition. And uh, he is clearly the view that as a professional, we absolutely should not be advocating the feeding of raw meat um, and raw foods to, to dogs or cats. Um, and that was his quote in, in this conference, which I think certainly if you are pro raw food would have put your hackles up. Um, and, and I think what I'm going to try to do tonight is there is there is some evidence to say to, to back why Mike says what he says, um, but I, let's try to put it over in a, in a manner that um, we can try to try to answer questions at the same time. 
Uh, Somebody may not be, uh, well, uh, Marge Chandler. Marge is uh, an American um, uh, veterinary surgeon who used to, it was a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh for, for I think, about 20 years. Um, and Marge is double board certified. She's a, a board certified internal medicine specialist, but she's also a clinical nutrition specialist. And um, uh, take, she's been an author of a paper in JAFMA uh, about 10 years ago, worrying about homemade diets that are raw being uh, deficient and inadequate for some of our patients. And uh, certainly as it even goes on presents evidence that, well, that's obviously true in many cases, but maybe that's not so much a problem anymore because of the rise of commercially available raw foods. But try to be balanced. Uh, I, I don't know Nick Thompson. Um, I'm not sure, Nick, if you're on the, if you're on the webinar. Uh, but Nick uh, founded the Veterinary Raw Feeding Group um, support group, um, which is an advocate uh, for, for feeding raw. And this was his response to Mike Davis, um, which was that uh, what he wants to see and what they see, he claims, will be that healthy, happy, safe pets, along with vets, nurses and owners. Um, I, I guess I sort of think, well, isn't that what all of us who are nurses and vets want to see? Um, but I think there's sort of put it out into practical thing that the quote from this from this veterinary nurse, Ella Roberts, below also fits this because this is someone who such quite an interesting read. Um, she was very skeptical about the benefits of raw food. And in her day-to-day -day life in practice, she just saw more and more clients who uh, and patients, but particularly clients who are aptly adamant that moving to raw food had made their cat or dog a happier or healthier animal. Um, so it, I think in that background, we've got two directly opposite views. And what we need to add is, well, where does the truth actually lie? What should we as professionals be recommending? Or what should we do, particularly as a profession, to try to make our patients um, uh, as, as healthy and as fit as possible, whilst hopefully keeping our clients as safe as possible. So why are we worrying about it? Well, you don't need me to tell you, certainly you know, I'm getting a bit old now, I'm not qualified 27 years, but even if we qualified in the last 10 years, you'll have seen a large change um, and a very rapid change in owners' attitudes. And uh, this is a paper in the vet record, it really quite right, nearly two thirds of owners feed their cats and dogs either all or sometimes a raw meat based diet and i think this will vary also in different parts of the uk wherever you are or wherever you are in the world if you're not in the uk um, but certainly in the more metropolitan areas and, and so around london I, i'm speaking to vets with through vvs where 80 to 90 percent of their clients are feeding raw so this is something that even five years ago we, we weren't really seeing but this is not just a uk problem this is a problem across the western world and I think the reason it's we need to worry about it is that people who are advocates for raw feeding are passionate, passionately passionate about this. And this paper here um, and another one I'll show you later has quite worryingly shown that uh, people who are advocates for um, raw feeding generally are more quick to disregard medical advice from their vet as well. So they will totally disregard what we say if you advocate more traditional um, commercially available food, but they were more likely to distrust what we say medically. And obviously that's a worry just on the client vet relationship, but particularly there's obviously something seriously wrong. And the reason that it's such an impassioned debate is when you, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, data to show that raw feeding advocates see their decision to do this as something that is caring, that they think it's more natural and therefore the right thing to do. And here are we with, uh, you know, five, six, seven years at university and lots of letters after name going, I think you're wrong. And as soon as you have that sort of, uh, sort of uh, disagreement, it's really hard. And so what I'm trying to do is put some data just to say what, what I think the data truly is at the moment and therefore how we can move forward. So what are the, what are the benefits, purported benefits of raw food? Well, the major four things that um, if you were to <clears throat> put things together is that number one, Advocates raw food will claim that it, it, it creates better digestion. And when you sort of quiz well, what do you mean by that, well, the first thing it says, well, you have smaller fecal volume and better formed feces. Um, and OK, I, I, I come on to whether that's true or not. Uh, a lot of clients will say though that they have a much shinier coat and they have a healthier skin and their skin allergies have gone away or their intestinal allergy has gone away. Um, and th th they're always very quick to blame that this is because commercially um, by be a tinned or kibble food has two more sugars and fillers and bulky additives into it um whether that's true we'll come on to in a second 
The third thing that uh, a lot of um, uh, raw meat advocates, diet advocates will say is that all dogs and cats fed raw food have definitely have stronger teeth and better dental hygiene. And um, it's again, there's, we'll come on to questioning that um, because at the moment, the evidence for that, spoiler alert, is quite sparse. And then just in general, things that, you know, that their dogs are more either more relaxed, but they have more energy. So if they were hyperactive, they're not as hyperactive anymore, um, but they have a better ability to exercise, um, that they uh, more like to lose weight um, and less flatulence. OK, so all from an actual diet. Is it true? Well, let's have a look and go back. One of the major reasons that raw feeding came about is saying, well, dogs, wolves in the wild never ate cooked food. What they would eat is they would feed prey and carrion. It's very high in protein, potentially high in fat, but fairly low in carbohydrates. And one of the trends, and I think there is some validity in this argument, is that in current commercial dog and cat foods, as is the case in humans, we're having more carbohydrates in the, in the diet. And whether that's healthy or not is, is, a, is a debate. But the raw um, meat-based diet proponents would say we should mimic what wolves in the wild would feed. And uh, yeah, it is true that a dog has a, uh, like a wolf, has a much shorter GI tract than, than humans do. But the question is, is that little dog that's sitting next to you now, so that makes me of the papillon that I've got sitting in the lounge, is that really still like a wolf? Let's have a look. The domestication of dogs is actually quite an interesting history on its own. And we... Um, the, the first sort of fossilized remains of what you think would be a, a dog-like canid was actually over 33,000 years old. But the consistent archaeological data to suggest that we were um, you know, domesticating dogs start really about 10 to 12,000 years ago. It certainly could be longer than that, but it's consistently that we think that we've been domesticating dogs for at least 10,000 years. And that fits with the uh, uh, sort of fossilized remains you find of goats and cattle as well. So, I mean, yeah, so we, this has been going on. We've been, dogs have been with us for a very long time, except in terms of evolution, this is a relatively short period of time, but relatively in terms of generations, this is a very long time indeed. The question is, why did we domesticate them? And, you know, the, the, the popular argument is, well, it helped us. They were helped us as a hunter-gatherer society. They would help us hunting. They'd help guard um, the families. And so what we did, we chose um, selected traits in their character from wolves that uh, that we liked that was good for that, and they slowly became more useful to us. But actually, that probably isn't true. I think the fact they're good at hunting and guarding is a, is a benefit for us. What's much more likely is fifteen to ten to fifteen thousand years ago is when we start to become much less no, much less nomadic. Sorry, as a, as a, a population, and we've developed settlements, and on those settlements there were food dumps, uh, waste dumps. And so that became an area where wolves could scavenge. And if the wolves are scavenging, then actually, if they, chances are, they become more tolerant and maybe even preference towards humans. And any wolf that wasn't aggressive, and therefore would be more likely to be accepted by the human. And therefore you start to select for traits that are beneficial for us. And you can certainly see um, that there's very clear evidence that there was uh, less aggression, more social cognition and more engagement with humans. And with that came some physical changes, smaller skull, um, lower, smaller teeth. Um, and so all the things we'd now say were um, more beneficial and less scary. But can we prove that genetically? Well, this is a really interesting uh, sort of um, report in Nature. Um, and, and the lead author, this lady, this lady here, Kirsten Lindbad Toe, is the, um, based in Uppsala in Sweden. And um, anything she publishes, she's probably published more on the canine genome than anyone else, I think, in the world. She's one of the, the leading, if not one of the most world leading authorities on canine genetics. And what they did, this is a, a study um, carried out where they took, um, they did a whole genome reconstruction from 12 wolves from different locations around the world. So trying to get um, a, a most representative sample they could. And then compared to this, did another sort of whole genome reconstruction, 60 dogs of different breeds. So again, trying to be um, as wide ranging as they could. And what they identified were that there were 36 areas of the genome that had changed between dog and wolf, and almost certainly therefore were targets of domestication. And what was really interesting in this is that of these 36, 19 of these areas 
relates to brain function. And so half of that was then in CNS development, which potentially, not definitively, potentially explains why they had behaviors in their change in the behavior. But what was really interesting to me is one third, just under a third of these genes that we've seen selection for relate to digestion and digestive tract. And most particularly in relation to starch and fat metabolism. Okay. So instantly we start to see evidence that domestication made genetic changes to dogs in the way they digested food. And I'm not saying evolution, um, it, it always brings benefit, but generally traits that um, may survive, there's a benefit in evolutionary terms to that species. So the indication here is that being able to start to digest starches in preference to fats and proteins was a survival advantage to these, these wolves and maybe is a very key parameter in why they became domesticated. And if you look into this in more detail, they actually identify particularly three genes um, that I've listed here. Um, and these are all genes that were switched on, activated, and are much more highly expressed as dog domestication has come through. And so what this would be very clear to suggest um, uh, and so this also matches things in the human genome that actually we, it was beneficial for us as a human species to start to digest more carbohydrates than a simple more sort of um, you know, protein and fat based diet. And so it would we've had this ability and dogs have had this ability to digest carbohydrates. I won't say preference, but it's certainly as well as proteins and to a very high degree of success for at least 10 millennia. So this would suggest that actually, although genetically you know dogs and wolves are obviously very similar it's a bit like saying us and chimpanzees are very similar there are some fairly important differences and so one of the major important differences is that dogs do not have the same genetics around their digestive tract because they've been designed and have adapted to have different foods to wolves so is there any other data to support this well yeah this is a, a an interesting paper from a human journal um where they're looking at the microbiota in the intestine and what they showed was that um, in this, that the dog um, microbiome is significantly different to a wolf microbiome when you look across, again, selection of wolves and the selection of different breeds. And although there's probably different breed variations in microbiome, and that's not something beyond uh, that we'll talk about tonight, there were very, very different marked differences. And so not only genetically, but from a microbiomic point of view, a dog's intestine is not the same as a wolf. So I don't think it is fair to say that just because wolves ate this way 10 to 15,000 years ago, that we should therefore be feeding our dogs in our living room the same because they're not the same. So is there any evidence, though, that actually feeding, you know, changing the microbiome is healthy? And this is one of these huge areas of, of, of research at the moment. And um, I, I'm, I'm becoming more interested in the microbiome. Uh, but I was at a lecture last week with a very eminent French human gastroenterologist who went, probiotics, waste of time, which was a bit depressing. And I think a lot of us are trying to focus on, can we improve a microbiome with, with probiotics? Anyway, I digress. So this was a, a really interesting paper in BMC Veterinary Research, okay, so uh, five years ago. And what they did, they they took eight boxes, uh, um, how closely related boxes to wolf is another point, but they, uh, they were on a, com a commercial diet and then they completely changed the raw. And uh, with a try with a uh, nutritionally balanced raw um, diet, and what they showed was they did see an improvement in fecal consistency. They did see reduced fecal volume. So maybe this is the only evidence I could find that the proponents of raw food saying, "Hey, I have better feces that are less of it." This paper supports that. And initially, this paper also said that there was a wider genetic diversity of the microbiome. So you think, well, maybe there is proof. Um, however, as I come on to a much larger study uh, out of Sweden, it goes against this completely. So might be some evidence that's beneficial, but we don't know. So what about, is there any evidence, again, in, in uh, GI disease? And you and I, uh, you certainly hear from clients probably every day that their dog had diarrhea and it got better as soon as they moved it to raw food. Well, there's been quite a lot of studies or so, evidence people doing sort of collective literature reviews and the first really frustrating thing is that in this paper from canadian vet journal 10 years ago 12 years ago basically concluded the evidence that that was being put put forward is a very low relevance and actually has very little scientific basis and i get and it's really frustrating 
And uh, one of my take-home messages tonight is if uh, I, you are a proponent of raw diets in dogs or cats and you're listening tonight, we need data. We absolutely need data because at the moment there is no real proof in terms of a peer-reviewed, ideally yeah, a two-arm or three-arm study to say whether it truly makes difference. There's lots and lots of anecdotal evidence, but we've got no proven evidence. And it can't be that difficult to design a study. And think something like the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine at the University of Nottingham would absolutely love to look at this sort of thing, I would imagine. I'm just putting the forward. I don't know. I haven't asked Marnie. But... So um, if you are a proponent, then there is, we need to know, because the bottom line is, as inquisitive professionals and as the advocates for our patients, we need to know, we need to open, keep our eyes open to the possibility that maybe some patients do improve. And what we then need to certainly do is how we make it safe for those clients. Okay, so I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I'm saying that I just, at this stage, remain to be convinced that there is good, any good evidence that raw foods truly improve health. But if there's so much anecdotal evidence, we should be able to get that answer. Okay, and I think our profession is the one that should be responsible for doing that. Um, now, this is the uh, paper I was talking about um, uh, from, uh, I said Sweden, so it's Germany. Okay, so many papers I'm going to present to you tonight. This is a really interesting paper in PLOS One. Um, there's some really pretty impressive papers sometimes in PLOS One. And this looked at a, um, a large number of dogs and looked at the microbiome and also at the metabolome. Now, metabolome is when you look in the serum at uh, lots of uh, metabolic products and uh, to see whether you've got good anti-inflammatory, pro-inflammatory, uh, look at amino acids and uh, cytokines. And they compared dogs fed on raw, raw diet and commercially duct food. And what was really interesting was that this was a, a pretty large study. They could not conclude that the change they saw were beneficial because they did see changes. They saw big changes in the microbiome and they saw big changes in the metabolome. But they couldn't decide if any of this was beneficial. And what was really interesting was that dogs fed the raw food, the dysbiosis index went up. What's the dysbiosis index? The dysbiosis index is um, a re marker, a reflection of the um, diversity of the microbiome. And if you have a higher index, it means that your microbiome diversity has reduced. So this paper is very strong with you that actually um, we these patients, the dogs fed raw food, did not have as balanced a microbiome as the dogs fed a commercially available kibble. And the other thing they found in this is they discovered that there's a, a bacteria in, in feces or in the colon called um, Clostridium hirononis. And C. hirononis is really important because what C. hirononis does is it breaks down primary bile acids that come from the ileum into secondary bile acids. And if you don't have that, then primary bile acid diarrhea is definitely something you don't want to have. Um, but more importantly, from the point of view of what we talk about tonight, secondary bile acids are very antibacterial. They help to reduce levels of pathogenic clostridia, salmonella, um, uh, and E. coli. So if you have lower levels of C. hirononis, it stands to reason you might get an overgrowth of potentially pathogenic bacteria within your colon. So this, the question is, this is a decent, well-designed study, and they said, we just can't prove there are changes if you're fed a raw food, but we can't prove it's beneficial. So what about the dental? Uh, is why I've heard a lot and you read a lot that dogs fed raw food um, or get to chew on bones particularly um, have better dental health and actually the only evidence I could find this was a was a review of from the RCVS knowledge online six years ago now where they did a complete literature review and the really quite depressing evidence, fact is that they didn't find any evidence that raw diets make any substantial benefit to um, the dental health and so I think this is there where you get, you get told this on a, on a daily basis, that can't be true. So this is one of these questions, we've got to sit down and answer this question properly. Okay. Um, and it's it, it just because it may be, we haven't asked the right question. So I'm not saying that it doesn't benefit. What I'm saying is that we don't have really clear proof in a large scale, ideally multinational or multi-center study to say, yes, this definitely is the benefit. Because if we have that, then we can actually start going, brilliant, what could we do to make it safe? And what is it in that that makes it safe? And what should we do? So going back to my slide I showed earlier, do it from the bottom right. Is there evidence of stronger teeth? Well, you hear anecdotally there is, but actually in a peer-reviewed literature, there's nothing. Do you have evidence of shiny coat and healthier skin? Again, I haven't presented the data on dermatology, but there's, there isn't actually 
as anywhere near the clearance that I would like there to be um, to say, yes, we can definitely say this works. Do we have better digestion? Again, you will hear every day that um, that they're better, that you have patients better, but there isn't the really strong peer-reviewed evidence. Do dogs and raw darts get more managed with smaller fecal volume? Almost certainly yes. Do they have less flatulence? Sometimes. Um, do they have firmer feces? There's one paper, that box of papers suggests that's true. But whether it's the level of evidence we would like as evidence-based medical professionals, I think is not there, is the answer. Doesn't mean it's not true. I'm saying the evidence isn't there. So let's go back to why this, if, if that's the case, why are they becoming so popular? Well, all the proponents will say that there's a, yeah, it's nutritionally superior for the reasons we've been through. Um, and a lot of proponents will just not trust commercial food. Now, you know, do you know what? They may have some warrants in that. Um, I don't know of any reports of melamine contamination um, of dry, of, sorry, of raw foods. There's a massive problem uh, with one particular manufacturer of this uh, in the States about 15 years ago. I don't know of vitamin D toxicosis. I know of three major um, cases of, of, sort of instances where there's been vitamin D overdose in commercially available foods in, in my working life. And um, any of you read or uh, London Vetcher last year, um, I've seen that the panleukopenia uh, or pancytopenia problem in cats that we started to see in the UK um, a few years ago, that almost certainly was due to mycotoxin contamination of commercially available food. So commercial food is not a panacea. It doesn't solve everything. It, it, it's not perfect. So, but um, I think the, the the flip side of that coin is that commercial foods do have a review process. They do have a recall process and that is then published. So, um, which again, we don't see from, from the other side. But I think the biggest thing for us is, as clinicians is this desire for owners to want to do the best, to feed more naturally, to be in control of what's going on. And you know, the, the, the increasing, particularly since COVID, the increasing bond between owners and, and their dogs in particular. So um, I think that's why. And I just want to emphasize the point again that the biggest thing I think why I want us to have a much more open and honest debate, hopefully without the um, polarizing passion, is that most these sort of three papers I've got, I'm quoting down here, all came to the same conclusion, which is that raw feeding proponents say consistently they trust either themselves or their breeder more than their veterinary surgeon when it comes to diet and that they do not trust our diagnoses medically as much as clients who feed commercial foods so they're much more distrusting so this is something that is potentially i think a real problem for us so um it's clear if you, again, there is certainly 10 years ago, some raw foods had nutritional deficiencies. I'd hazard a guess that may be not so true now, as I've already alluded to, because I think there are, I think it's 75 or 80 different commercial food, raw food manufacturers just in the UK alone now, all pumping lots of money and trying to get balanced raw food. So it'd be interesting to see if that is actually now as true as it was before. But my biggest concern with raw food is risk of infection. And that's what I want to focus a bit on tonight. Because um, there is very, very, very clear evidence, as I'll present you now, that patients who are fed raw foods definitely shed way more bacteria and parasitic infections into the environment. Um, and the biggest problem here is that most, not saying all, but most commercially raw foods are frozen. And the manufacturer will claim that that kills pathogens and, and it, that, to harsh reality, that just isn't true. Freezing does reduce the parasitic burden considerably, but it does not eliminate it 100% whereas cooking would if it's cooked properly. But freezing absolutely does not reduce the bacterial burden. All it does is it puts them in suspended animation. And, uh, it, you know, you know yourself from something you put in the freezer. If you didn't store it properly beforehand and then you thaw it, it's very quickly can become infected. So freezing is not a safe way of handling these foods. And that then potentially leads to a problem. So, um, so I think... Yeah, we need better regulation. Um, and uh, there's certainly yeah, one silly example. Um, I'm starting to take advice calls, and I've heard other colleagues do the same, about dogs getting hyperthyroidism. Now, that's something we talk about at school hardly happens. But there seems to be a really clear association of, of, of dogs being fed trachea or tracheal um, parts that have got thyroids in them, um, actually having such an intake of I presume it's the thyroxine within the thyroid that they're eating that actually get thyrotoxicosis as a result. 
So this is something, again, if we just be open and honest about it, then we can stop that happening. Um, then these are things where I really want to take, create a decent debate. So when did the, in the literature, when did the concern about infection start to rise? Well, these are two papers from about uh, 20 years ago, both published in JAFMA. Uh, Journal of Veterinary Medical Association, which started to raise the concerns that actually raw food may have a public health risk and a risk to our patients. So what's the basis for this? So let's take, I'm going to take uh, Salmonella, E. coli, a little bit on uh, Campylobacter. Um, although I could be here all night. So let's look at Salmonella. Um, in the UK alone, there are 282,000 medical or hospital admissions with food poisoning in the UK each year, okay? And around 700 people die each year from food poisoning. Of that, around 200 will be due to salmonella. Um, so this is, it, it, you could say it's not a huge problem, but it's a genuine real problem. So the question is, how common is salmonella in healthy dogs? And um, I was certainly taught at vet school, and even in my residency, um, or taught, I read, that around 20% of dogs naturally shed salmonella. Okay, but is that actually true? This is quite an old paper, um, uh, you know, a very old paper actually, looking at dogs in Florida in 1952. Around 15% of dogs were shedding salmonella. 1952, there was very little commercial dog food available. So these dogs are probably fed table scratch and, and, and effectively what we call raw. When you look at the more the recent literature, the amount of dogs who naturally shed salmonella is monumentally less. Um, yeah, ranging from 4% in the study in Iran through to zero in New Zealand, although whether you can really believe that. And the largest study I am aware of in the UK was, was published seven years ago, um, again, looking at nearly 500 dogs, where they said that 0.23%, so two and a bit dogs in every thousand, will be shedding salmonella naturally. Okay. So, but is that, and these, um, what are, does it depend on when you're feeding? So this is the first paper way of looking at um, dogs fed raw chicken. Okay, and this is in the Canadian Vet Journal. There's only 10 dogs in, in each group, so the test dog and the, and the control dogs. And the test dogs were fed the raw chicken, um, and the control dogs were fed normal commercial kibble. And what they found was quite worrying me. 80% of the raw food had, a, had salmonella in it. And, sorry, and 30% of the dogs were fed that without actively shedding the salmonella in their feces, compared to zero percent of either in the dogs fed the commercial available diet so that instantly makes you think well oh, that's potentially worrying now you know not only does it risk that potentially although these aren't necessarily horribly pathogenic forms of salmonella um this is this, it's, it's a multivirulent organism so then the bigger study this is actually came from colorado state university in in, in america and, and really sad story here what they had it there um, teaching hospital, they had three puppies from a, a greyhound um, a, a breeding facility and racing yard, all come in for post-mortem because it all died. And uh, they found they all had um, salmonella enteritis and salmonella sepsis. And so that then triggered a study by the guys at CSU as to what was going on. And what they found was that there were um, 138 dogs in this facility and they were all fed raw food. And they found that 63, so just under two thirds of the um, samples of the food were positive for salmonella, but 93% of the dogs were shedding. And when they found the types that were shedding, they were the same as the type that had caused the death of these three puppies. Now, I'm not saying, you know, you've got to take this pinch of salt. This doesn't sound like a particularly clean environment. Um, so you can't necessarily just blame the raw food. But genetically, they could prove that the salmonella that was in the food was then what was being found shedding and potentially was the same as that killed these three puppies. So there's a direct horizontal, sorry, vertical link saying that if you that there is a, a bigger risk that is not been seen in the previous paper if you're feeding a raw food. And the percentage of dog shedding here is massively more than is probably now thought to be the worldwide average, depending on the country. So... This is another uh, little uh, um, study, which is quite scary because this look at pets, at at pets as therapy dogs. And uh, um, and the lead author here, a chap called Scott Weiss, um, if I, just a little plug, if Scott's um, an absolute guru of, of uh, antibiosis, antimicrobials, and um, our, what our use of them as a veterinary profession should be. Um, and I heard him lecture last week and it was brilliant. So if ever he's coming to BSAVA or London Vet Show, I don't know if he will, but if ever you get a chance to hear him speak, I would urge you to go. 
um, he will change your view on how we should use antibiotics forever in a, in a positive way. But anyway, what his group did here, they um, they looked at 200 pets at therapy dogs in the US and they assessed them um, over a year. And of these 200, 20% um, so 40 of them were fed a raw, raw food and 80% were just on commercial, I say cooked food, but I mean by this either tinned or dried kibble. And what they found was that the dogs feed, being fed the raw food had a um, seven and a half fold increase in the risk of salmonella shedding compared to dogs that weren't fed raw meat. And that the dogs who fed the raw meat were much more likely to test positive salmonella at, at least once a year. Now, when you look at odds ratios, very basic way to look at odds ratios is that an average odd is one. So in this, this is 22 times more likely to be shedding salmonella. And the other thing that was really quite scary was that these dogs had a 17-fold increase in the risk of develop, uh, shedding multi-resistant E. coli. Now, these are dogs that are going into schools and hospitals and old people's homes to help the people. And yet they could be shedding very pathogenic bacteria to vulnerable um, humans. So this is, this is genuine. This is, this is a real risk. I will say the instance of human disease as a result of this, we still don't think is particularly high, but the risk is definitely there. And as the vets sort of in charge of the dogs, I think we need to be very aware of that. So what about in cats? There's the same happening in cats. So this was a, a really nice paper in Journal of Clinical Microbiology. It's a human paper, human journal, sorry. And uh, what they did, they got 11 veterinary laboratories in the US to collate their results together. Uh, looking at um, fecal um, the population or instance of salmonella in feces in cats. Um, and they found that instance was actually 1% and in dogs it was 2%. What was interesting though, certainly then in the dogs, was that only 55% of those that were positive had diarrhea, which means 45% of the dogs were shedding potentially pathogenic salmonella completely silently. Um, and when they then went back and, and did sort of, uh, sort of reverse analysis on the data, they found that there was a huge, that what were the risk factors of dogs um, shedding salmonella? Number one, if they begin the course of antibiotics by the vet, because you've caused, we've caused a dysbiosis. Number two, interestingly, that they were given probiotics, um, which raises the question of what's the probiotic doing? The thirdly was raw food. And so the studies decided that concluded that raw food was one, not the only, but one potential major risk for salmonella infection and shedding in dogs and cats. Um, so, and again, look at cats. This is a, there's much less in, in cats um, in the literature, but this is a interesting case of cats that are indoor cats that were fed raw diet. They were presented to um, their, their vet uh, and they identified salmonella, um, both in the food samples and in one of the cats. Um, and they made the diagnosis salmonella treated, but it was a very clear link that the salmon in the food had caused salmonella in the dogs, in, sorry, in the cats in this case. So, it does, it does happen. So what about in the UK? I've talked about studies in Italy and in the US. Well, this is a paper you may have seen in, in uh, JSAP uh, a couple of years ago, where they looked at um, fecal samples from uh, nearly 200 dogs. And all those 190, 114 were on raw food and 76 were on commercial foods. And it's interesting, this one, that only 4% of the dogs in this study that were fed raw foods shed salmonella. So here we go. We've got slight discordancy in the literature. I've said one, there was 93% in that study in Colorado. And here we've got dogs fed raw food, only 4% are shedding salmonella. But there was no shedding at all in the commercial diet group. But what this paper started to raise the question was, hang on, it's not just about salmonella, what about E. coli? And what was really scary here is they looked at antibiotic resistant E. coli, multidrug resistant E. coli, and third generation cephalosporin E. coli, resistant E. coli. And that's quite scary because if it's resistant to third generation cephalosporins, we are running out of antibiotics to treat these patients. And in the dogs of fed raw, there was a, a 51, 54% uh, instance of antimicrobial resistant E. coli in their feces, 25% instance of multi drug resistant, and 31% instance. So a third of these dogs were shedding third generation cephalosporin resistant E. coli. Compared to the dogs in uh, fed normal food, that was those 4%. So those are the, the, the figures you can see on, on here. So there is very clearly a very marked risk of not just salmonella, but E. coli, because these dogs are now shedding multi-resistant E. coli. 
Um, just to take this a little step further, this is a really sad case report um, from an uh, epidemiology and infection, um, which I think from memory is in North London. Um, and what these are four connected people. Um, so uh, I think two were cohabiting. And they contracted a Shiga toxin producing E. coli. Now, Shiga toxin is nasty because it can cause a thing called hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is where you get uh, vasculitis and microthrombi, which then leads to hemolysis, hemolysis and uh, coagulopathies. And you generally die of acute renal failure. And fifth, there's a 50% death rate with, with this particular condition. And really sadly, one of these four people did die of hemolytic uremic syndrome. And three of the four people in the study had direct contact with dogs who were fed raw tripe. And when they did a public health review, they identified Shiga toxin E. coli in the tripe that the dogs were being fed that these people had contact with. So it was impossible for the public health authorities to prove that they got the infection from uh, the dogs, but the genetic strain of the Shiga toxin was almost identical. So they were very concerned in this paper that the feeding of raw of raw tripe to the dog had led to the death of a person. Now, horribly sad, it is only one person, I accept that. And the, but again, I think it just highlights quite the risk that could happen if we don't handle this food properly and we're not very cognizant of the risk that there may be. Um, so this was then, a look at, again, think of sugar toxins. Is, is it just a one-off in, in North London? So this is a pub, uh, study from Switzerland. Again, human uh, journal microorganisms here. And they looked at commercially available raw meat products for dogs in Switzerland. And they found that 59% tested positive for sugar producing E. coli. Okay, well, that's really quite scary. And then what's even more scary, of that 59%, um, half, so 29% of the total, so half of those, um, actually have the highly pathogenic subtype that is almost certainly going to cause hemolytic uremic syndrome. Okay. So that's, yeah, this is a, a country I think we'd all look at as having very high standards in everything. Um, so there is definitely, although uh, you don't need much contact with toxin, so the low infectious dose, there's a real risk of this for people who are feeding this. And this isn't people just... Um, you know, diet that you're just not handling the meat properly at home. And this is commercially available um, food that is already contaminated with a really nasty bacteria and toxin. So are there any other samples? Well, again, let's move um, to, to another country. Let's look at the Netherlands. And uh, they, again, similar thing. They looked at raw meat, commercially available raw meat products, raw meat diets available in the Netherlands. And they found... 0157 E. coli, which causes nasty enteritis in people in just under a quarter of the products. Um, they found extended beta-lactamase, um, spectin so this is an E. coli that's resistant to pretty much everything you and I've got on the shelf in 80% of the products. That's pretty sobering thought, really. Listeria. Um, and they also, they found some you know, parasites. Yeah, these are things that we don't want. So, and these are in commercially available foods. And this is recent. This is only five, six years ago. So I, I think this does raise the question that whilst I don't doubt that raw uh, diet manufacturers have their definitely are passionate about what they do and do their very best to produce uh, you know, high quality products. I'm not saying that, but the evidence suggests that there are still, there are problems that occur. And this is this is worrying. And then uh, another study to back this up is from Utrecht Vet School in the Netherlands, which is you know, one of the world's very best vet schools. And they looked at cats, um, uh, again, just uh, 70 cats fed normal food and 19 cats fed uh, raw meat based diets. And look at this difference here. They found ESBL, extended beta-lactamase spectrum producing bacteria. So this is multi-resistant E. coli in 6%, just under 6% of the control group and nearly 90% of those fed the raw food. Okay, so it's, um, and then when it actually looked at the food themselves, they managed to find it in the, this, in the nasty bacteria, again, in just under 78% of the food itself and in none of the commercially available cooked foods. So, yeah, you and I do not want to get an ESBL and you don't want your patients to get it because you, you know, um, this is one of the bacteria that I think you know, will potentially doom mankind if we're not careful um, because we are running out of antibacterials to, to treat this. Uh, certainly in veterinary medicine, we have So this is something that's potentially really problematic. 
And lastly, just to go to the other side of the world, let's look at uh, the thing from E. coli, I'm uh, sorry, <laughs> from Brazil. And uh, this is a study looking at, uh, say, the um, uh, fecal analysis of dogs fed raw foods um, or conventional foods. And I think the, the main takeaway from here is that dogs fed, and this is what this, this all the star bar on the bar graph here shows, dogs have fed a raw meat-based diet were substantially more likely to shed E. coli strains that resistant to three or more antimicrobials. Okay, so the, the problem of, uh, of fecal shedding of resistant bacteria is genuine, um, and uh, it, you know it, this is something we don't know the knock-on effect to humans yet. Another question as veterinary and medical professionals we need to answer. That's that's very fair. What real problem is this in humans? We don't know, but the potential for it to be a big problem is definitely there. So, done a bit on salmonella, some of it on, on E. coli. What about Campylobacter? Well, this is a, a, a study in New Zealand um, from Massey um, in New Zealand. And they looked, again, at raw, commercially available raw diets um, uh, and then looked at, at the dogs and cats um, being fed them. And what they found was that just over a quarter of the products contained Campylobacter and that uh, then a third of the dogs that were being fed it they tested positive Campylobacter. Okay, only 13% of those are CG Juni, which is one you really don't want to get, but that's still 13% too many, really. And what was really scary was, look at this, the dogs fed raw meat food were 12 times more likely to carry um, uh, Campylobacter upsilanus than dogs feeding dry foods. And so, and it, that was always repeating the cats. So 5% um, yeah, of the cats fed raw food has CG Juni, and 16% over all the cats would have a, a Campylobacter that's potentially pathogenic. So this is in, here we are, three different groups of bacteria where we could easily have a problem. Is it just bacteria, though? And the answer is no. This is a, you probably haven't seen this because it's published in JVIM. If any of you are particularly interested in internal medicine as, a, as, as your sort of professional interest, um, Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine is the is the journal where everything is at. It's now online. Um, there's so many papers published. It comes out every other month. There's almost too many papers in it to read. Um, but if you want, it, 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 it's a it's good reading. And this is a paper from the RVC. Um, they had a, a, a little case report of an Alaska Malamute. Excuse me. <laughs> I apologize. Excuse me. And this was fed raw food. And it got invested for um, a potential cholangia hepatitis. And sure enough, the guys at the QMH diagnosed them to have cholangia hepatitis. And they did uh, bile cytology, and they found that there was a sarcoid, uh, so coccidial um, a protozoal, sitting in the uh, in the bile cytology, and it was this uh, thing called Hamondii heydoni. Now, there's no definitive proof, but previous reports, learn it from here in a human journal, say that raw meat samples, raw um, diets, have been closely associated with this particular coccidia. So. Um, whether it's the dog made a complete recovery, apparently, but it's very suggestive, not proof, that his dog picked up a coccidial parasite that caused significant clinical disease as a direct result of being fed a commercially available raw food. And I think um, this is the one that worries me possibly more than anything, because I, I did actually see one of the cats in this. Um, whilst I was at a, in my previous clinical role, we, we had three cats come in that had TB. And uh, uh, they were all fed a venison-based raw meat diet. And this was then put together by Daniel Gunmore and colleagues at Edinburgh um, uh, with, because 47 in total cats had the same problem. And they were all diagnosed with TB and uh, either proven or very strongly suspect to have uh, Mycobacterium bovis, so the form that humans can get. And they'd all been fed this uh, venison raw diet. And what was really scary was four of the owners, one of whom was one of our clients, and one of the attending vets were found to have a latent infection required, and one of this owner required treatment because they were a vulnerable, immunocompromised adult. So TB is a growing concern in human medicine as it is. Um, and uh, this is yeah, a small, relatively small number in the big scheme of things, but TB in cats, we don't think is a common problem as it is. And so there's really compelling evidence that the raw diet these cats were fed on was the most likely route of the embovis infection in this outbreak of cases. And if you're interested in this, I say um, uh, this was published uh, back in 2020. So I'm probably depressing you now, 
So I'm going to stop talking about infections, okay? Because, but these are the things I haven't had time to cover, where if you do a, a literature search, you'll find evidence of all of the list you've got down here being associated um, of increasing incidence in dogs and cats fed raw food. And uh, some of which, uh, Yersinia, um, Yersinia pestis is the plague. I'm not saying it's the plague, but it's the level. Um, uh, Brucella, we're all worried about Brucella as it is from dogs being imported, but this potentially will root through food. Then Toxo, Giardia, and then yeah, Tinea, things that, you know, that, that we don't really want to get. And you just think about coming from undercooked pork, but this could be something we're going to start seeing um, if we're not careful. Okay. So... I hope by just going through that, I just it, this. So, the question, the one thing I would say, in fairness, though, about infection, is that all that data I've shown is pretty scary. But actually, in the the paper from the Munich group, where they looked at the metabolome and the microbiome, one of the things they did say was, if you look at the instance of disease in veterinary patients, actually, it still doesn't seem to be that high in dog-fed raw foods. And I think that's a really fair comment that these are all potential and in some cases real risks, how much of a clinical issue it's really causing us is also a question we've got to answer as a profession, okay? So maybe there's lots of theoretically really horrible risk, but actually the true instance of disease is going to be much, much lower. I think we need to answer that, okay? So um, the risks are real and we need to learn how to handle these foods better and how to handle those patients more adequately. Um, both in routine management in the hospital, in your clinics and at home. But what I really want to know is we need to establish how much risk is this truly? Okay, so I hope that's a balance, trying to be as balanced as I possibly can, because it maybe it's nowhere near as much of a problem as the data currently suggests. So while we're here though, the other trend I said was vegan foods. And um, this is something uh, that is, you don't need me to tell you, is becoming increasingly uh, more common. And so this is a, a really nice um, study uh, joint between Guelph in Canada and Massey in New Zealand. And they did an online survey, which obviously they're not always great, but there's three and a half thousand people, okay, which is fairly impressive. And you can see the split of the respondents there. And what was interesting was that 97% um, uh, of the people said they fed the uh, animals a meat containing diet, even though you know, over 10%, 15% of the respondents were either vegetarian, vegan, or pescatarian. But half of those respondents said they had a concern about meat containing foods. And, um, you know, which is interesting. Now, 91% said they had at least one concern about plant foods, but I think there's not much evidence, not much, as much information out there unless you're really keen to find out. But the move towards vegan foods is definitely becoming something that is going to be, I think, the next thing that will challenge us. So, and this is a really interesting um, study from University of Lincoln um, from two years ago. Again, online survey. And they said, well, what is it that makes you, for the question, what makes you choose food? And the first, palatability was the third most important thing. Um, and actually, they found that good vegan diets are really palatable because there's, and they, you know, so there doesn't seem to be a difference in the palatability between vegan or conventional foods or raw foods. And so this is some, yeah, if, if, if the dog eats or the cat eats what they like, if they like it, so then they're more likely to eat it. We instantly means vegan diets become a possibility. So does, is vegan food good? Um, we all hear, you know, it, it's in the human literature now quite strongly that having a plant-based diet may be better for us than a meat-based diet and there's some really interesting things on um, power athletes i'm quite intrigued at this I'm, I'm not a power athlete don't worry um but but moving to a vegan diet in sort of cyclists and sprinters um uh, weightlifters can actually improve their performance which is quite intriguing so this is a uh, an online survey again of just over two and a half thousand owners and of that just over half have fed a normal diet third were fed a raw a raw meat-based diet and around 13 percent were vegan um, for at least a year and what they asked these client these owners to do they had seven indicators of general health okay and, and you've got the list here so using medication um you, you know having to how do the owner felt they were whether they went to the vet more often than normal were they unwell or not and what was really interesting in this study and this is something for for the raw meat group as well as the vegan group if dogs on conventional dry or um, cooked commercial food generally did slightly worse 
than the other two in that they had slightly lower general health uh, indicators. Um, and the, the dogs exhibit here that had health as well that year, just under half the ones that did had conventional food, 43% the raw food, but only 36%. And that was statistically significant. So there is some suggestion support here that maybe a bit owner bias, there is potential owner bias in this, obviously, um, but that maybe vegan diets are better. And there is a little bit, a little glimmer of hope here for the raw meaty bones group that raw meat diets definitely aren't worse, might be better than commercial foods. But um, that's it. But then the, uh, this is a, a study in, in the States where um, they were looking at vegan foods. And because the worry we have, obviously, particularly in cats, is it going to be, um, uh, is it suitable? Should we be feeding cat a vegan food? That's a moral debate as well as, as a scientific one. And so they um, they compared it to the international standards, um, particularly in America and AF, AAFCO, the recommendations for what a dietary consistency, consistency should be. And they looked at four of the diets available. And what they found was that they had, if you look at macros, so, you know, for protein, fats, carbohydrates, um, it just on that level, they all matched what the recommendations are. But you'll see, actually, one of them had low calcium, low potassium, low sodium. Cat food all had uh, low, a much lower potassium content. Well, that's not good for cats. Typically, they're not going to eat. Copper concentrations were high, too high in all the foods. And that potentially could have osteopathic consequences. Zinc levels were too high. Um, and the cat food didn't meet the arginine requirements, let alone the amount of protein and taurine. So I think now this is, um, it, say it's, it's a Brazilian state, so maybe this is just one. Um, there are some, I think, again, some companies trying to make excellent vegan food, but we need to make sure it's truly balanced. And the other thing just to, to raise, if you want to be really, truly, strictly vegan, um, is that, and I, I don't know um, if this has changed. When I researched this uh, earlier in the year, this was the situation we're in. Um, I don't think it's changed. Is that you have to have vitamin D added um, to, to, our, to our pet foods by, by law. And the only one that we have to use is D3. That, the only uh, licensed form of that, comes from sheep. And therefore, it is not vegan. So if you, um, and vitamin D2, which is plant-based, doesn't really have the same effect as vitamin D3. So we've got, it is quite an issue here. And I think I'm just, I'm not having a view on this. I'm going to put it out there that under the Animal Welfare Act, an owner has to ensure that their patient is, fed, their pets are fed a suitable diet. And when cats are obligate carnivores, is a vegan diet a suitable diet? Answers on a postcard, please. But technically, if it's not, then anyone who's feeding a cat a vegan diet is committing a criminal offence. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but that's where we are. So the other problem, I think, though, and I'm just going to say where you've flagged, though, for um, vegan diets, and potentially also the raw meat diets, which is this is a study from Australia. Um, so if anyone's Australian on the call, I don't mean to read here, but I just, yeah, I think of steaks and barbecues and really great food if I think of Australia. Um, and uh, um, this was a study looking at... Um, What's the literature like? And what this study showed was that actually, when you look at um, the, 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 the popular media and scientific articles are actually generally biased in favour of the meat industry um, and, and farming. So uh, whether it's overt or tacit, but most dietary articles. So really the take home for this is actually it's quite hard for vegan diets to shout loudly and potentially for the, the raw meat diets to do, do the same. So do we really have all the information we need to make the evidence decisions? Do we really, really, really have it? And I think it's something you have to dig really hard to find. So last few slides before we can open the questions. I can see there's 10 in the chat box already. So um, I hope this has been useful. I hope you can see I'm genuinely trying to come from a, uh, a as neutral stance as it's possible to come, but I can't ignore the science that we have. It is true that, so what conclusions can we reach? Um, I think the evolutionary debate that feeding raw meat diet is more natural for the gut is just fundamentally flawed in the dogs and cats. But dog, the genetic difference is there. Dogs are not small wolves when it comes to the way their gut functions um, or the genetic expression control of the enzymes. Um, I think that there is some evidence the raw meat diet satisfy the dogs more. I think that's true. But there's very little, in fact, no pipri evidence that I could find 
the, let alone consistently, that they are better to proving health. And I just, it's my appeal to anyone who's pro this is please get studies organized um, because if it is truly better, we should better prove that. Um, it is true that some members might make a balance, balance my, microbiome, but the, the German study, I said, uh, questions whether that's true. There's anecdotal evidence improves oral health, GI health, but we just don't really know. Um, but I think we also, as I said at the beginning, a yeah, huge concern over the increasing carbohydrate rich diet that we have in, in human medicine, obesity, a carbohydrate rich diet in cats, the increasing rise of diabetes in cats. So maybe we need a balance here and we should remain open as a profession, as professionals, to the possibility that the, there are negative health connotations with modern carbohydrate rich diets. I think we, we can't say there's not. And as I said, we, we have to acknowledge also that. Um, yeah, there are problems with major commercial manufacturers' foods, and a lot of clients don't like it. And I think if you take a step back, when you walk into a clinic tomorrow, imagine you're a client that's a bit skeptical, and you sit down in your waiting room, and there's a wall of food from one manufacturer. There's a very, um, that is potentially a really negative message to clients. Um, and I think we just need to question, how do we position ourselves as, as professionals? If we want to have an honest debate with our clients to say, hey, this is why I don't want you to feed raw food. If you've got a whole wall of, of, of hills or raw cannon or purine or whatever it might be out in your waiting room, you are lost the battle already, okay? And so just a question. Um, my last clinic, we made a deliberate decision to have no food on display. And we also made the deliberate decision we'd have no deals with one manufacturer. I know if you're in a corporate, there'll be one you have to use. Can't change that. But we gave each clinician freedom to choose the food they wanted to give on a prescription basis because then you're trying to be as fair as possible. I think where you can, that's a really great way forward. And the last thing I say on this bit is, is as good scientists, I hope we always would see ourselves as a science, having had a science education. We need to recognize that not having good evidence might be because the right questions haven't yet been asked and good studies have not yet been carried out. And I would just say, I think that we should be doing that to see if we can answer, you know, all the bacteriological data I put up, how dangerous and what incidental clinical disease is that truly causing? So I think, you know, there is definitely un unambiguous evidence that raw meat-based diets are potentially risky to both animal and public health, okay? And the shedding of, of uh, multi-resistant, highly pathogenic bacteria is really scary. So if I go back to my, I accept provocative, and I hope you weren't offended by a provocative lecture title, I don't think there is evidence to say that raw meat diets are the solution to everything. And I do think they're a potentially worrying trend, but we need more data to try to work out what the situation truly is, okay, and help us make more informed decisions. And we've got to try and balance this with our desire for our clients to do what they genuinely believe in the best interests, whilst we're acting as the advocate, and legally that's what you and I have to do, be the advocate for our patients, and the duty to do what we think is in the best interest of the animals that are entrusted into our care. Vegan foods, I think it's a totally different set of questions because um, there's no evidence that vegan foods pose any public health risk at all. And there is now early, albeit limited evidence, that vegan foods might be beneficial for dogs. Okay, not proven, but uh, again, I think over time there will be a data, it'll be really interesting to see what comes out in that support. There is evidence that vegan foods in some countries may not be totally balanced, but I'm sure that will change in time. Question of whether cats should be fed a vegan diet is that that's a big one for us, I think. And we're going to have to, you know, you may think that's black and white, but we've still got to work out how to explain that to clients. Um, so I think vegan diets might be a solution to some things. Um, they're definitely a trend and further investigation is what we need to do. And that's me. So I hope that is helpful. Um, and let's see what we've got questions we have. I was going to say, Rob, are you prepared? We've got some great questions coming up. So I do apologize in advance if we don't go through all of these. Um, I'm going to kind of, well, we might need to fly through some of them. This, but thank you so much for everyone's time. And that was really brilliant. I think demonstrates how thought provoking it was with all these questions. So to start, um, someone has asked, wouldn't it be expected for the dysbiosis index to go up in raw fed animals because they stop being exposed to carbs and therefore will reduce the needed microbiome diversity? Yeah. Hi, Vanessa. Thanks for the question. Um, uh, not necessarily, because the question is, why do we need the microbiome diversity with carbohydrates? Is it cause or effect? 
Okay, so do we have any, a diverse microbiome because the carbs are there and different bacteria can then feed on them? Or is it essential to have those microbacteria there, those bacteria there to help balance the microbiome because we're eating carbs? I'm going to be honest to say, I don't know the answer to that. Um, the question, so you may have some validity to your answer to your question without a doubt. My worry is with the um, see here and honest, you know, that, that if that level drops and you stop converting as many of your primary bile acids to secondary, that potentially can cause a problem. But it's a fair point. Um, I think more study needs to be done to explain that. Thank you, Rob. Uh, someone has asked why we don't have a human kibble diet yet, um, as it, you know, it potentially is better than a raw meaty bones diet. Why uh, the difference between dog and humans in terms of diet and its health benefits? I think that's also probably da partly down to human choice. We like to, uh, we don't like the same meal two days in a row. I, yeah, do you know what? This is a really interesting question. And some, um, I've often thought that we actually generally feed our dogs better and in a more balanced fashion than we feed ourselves, you know, um, because um, so it, it, I don't know is the answer to that. I think you're right. We want human choice. I, I will want to say I'm not, I think to balance my own view, I'm not here saying to his advert for kibble. I do understand that feeding kibble does seem unnatural. Um, and I think, you know, I do feed my dogs a, a mixture of kibble and, and, and wet, um, but it's commercially available. My daughter is adamant we should be moving to dry, uh, so to, to raw food. Okay. And if any of you've got children, know how persuasive 16 year old girls can be. So, um, but I would say it's a really good question. I think the, the manufacturers spend millions trying to create balanced diets. And maybe if you were, you know, it's what's on the space shuttle, isn't it? It's just a balanced dried food. We want more variety. Um, but it's in terms of diet and health benefits, I don't know would be the answer. And then Sarah has very kindly said, um, she's shared later on. So if anyone is interested in reading these papers, that there's a couple of papers looking at dental disease um, from in dogs having bones um, and hunt, in hunt kennels and dingoes in Australia. Um, the conclusion was less tartar, but no improvement in periodontal disease and more fractured teeth. So Sarah's kindly um, shared those papers further down. So thank you for that, Sarah. And um, thank you, so Sarah, I completely forgot to reference that paper. I'm sorry. Thank you for raising it. <laughs> really grateful. Um, if, do you know if there's any research on how commercial diets, dry, wet, semi-moist have affected the GI tract of dogs? Um, kill diets have been around for 60 years. Yeah, do you know what? That is a really fair question. And um, I'm not aware, again, it's a good question. I don't think there is a direct answer, a direct study to answer that question. However, it's also a difficult thing to answer because our breeds we're dealing with have changed an awful lot in 60 years. And I think the quality um, and the components of dry kibble have also changed an awful mm. lot in 60 years. Um, but I, I'm not implying anything on the question, but if the question... Uh, if someone asks that question with a sceptical view of kibble isn't the solution to everything, I think that's fair to comment. I don't think there are. Um, and the proponents of raw meat, raw meat diets would say that dry kibble food is increasing the risk of disease. I don't think there's evidence of that, but it's possibly because we haven't asked the question the right way. So um, I don't think there's evidence of that, but it's a very fair question to ask. Uh, we, Elizabeth has asked, is it possible that the reasons owner report digest digestive issues clearing up after switching to raw is due to maybe an allergy or intolerance to a specific protein? Um, and if they've done an effective exclusion diet beforehand, uh, then they may not elicit such an improvement. Yeah, Elizabeth, really great question. I, I suspect the answer is yes. I think they would have seen the same result if you'd done uh, an exclusion diet using a prescription food. Um, not always. Um, uh, true allergies to <laughs> dark allergies. One of those things that hard things. Um, I'll just place it. Please never do blood tests for allergies in dogs for food. They just <laughs> waste the time. Okay, they don't give you accurate data at all. And I don't think you find a single medicine specialist in the UK who uses them. So you and I have a real problem in diagnosing true allergy. I always say it's an intolerance. Um, and intolerances are normally to proteins possibly some carbohydrates and i think if you yes you're right that um uh if you go for raw food and it gets better there is definitely a chance that you're not you are no longer feeding the carb or the protein that patient was intolerant of and you could have achieved that maybe using 
a, a different diet or a hydrolyzed diet of some sort. I think that's a distinct possibility, yes. I'm not saying it's always the case, Elizabeth, but I think it's true in, in a large number. And how about high pressure processing used in raw dog diets? Is it beneficial? Yeah, I, that's a really good question. Um, the Now, I don't have papers to back this up, but I am aware, so I can't quote you studies. I am aware that there are papers because high pressure processing is supposed to kill all parasites and reduce the bacterial load to practically zero. And I am I will double check and I'm happy to put something out through VVS if I'm wrong on this, but I'm pretty certain there is no evidence to show that high pressure processing does not kill as all the bacteria in the way that cooking at the right temperature does. So it is probably better than freezing. Yes, but I don't think it's as good as cooking. Fantastic. Thank you. And someone is really challenging me this evening i've had to google this before i ask the question what about designing valid hacp plans for um, raw meaty bones diet and to confirm that is hazard analysis critical control point so like the fda put together uh, um yes great idea <laughs> I, I, um I, I, I just I, I don't know if, if the question is still online. Um, are you referring to in the manufacturing or into the handling of food in the house and the clinic? Because I think certainly you will be hospitalizing dogs and cats on raw food. I don't know what means to know what people's views on this is. I think you absolutely should be doing hazard control point analysis in these patients. If yeah. we did it in the house um, and owners, if we could really help owners prepare these foods in the most hygienic way possible that would markedly reduce the incidence of disease um, and reduce the risk of potential disease. Sorry. I, what I, you'd still though have to do that in the manufacturing process because the data is clear. These foods are contaminated when you buy them in quite a few cases, not all, but quite a few. It looks like you could do it both at the manufacturing level, but potentially, you know, if you know that you've got a lot of raw fed within your, um, veterinary practice i don't know if that you know when if you are f choosing to feed raw feed and in, in food in the veterinary practice yeah. you know there's lots of levels you could do it at um brilliant thank you for that question uh another question people may think they handle their pets feces appropriately to re reduce the zoonotic risk but do we need to be concerned regarding their saliva too yeah hannah that's a really good question and i must admit i don't know if there are any papers looking at salivary contamination in uh but it would stand to reason that a dog that is shedding salmonella and esbl e coli it's going to clean itself it's going to have that content in its oral cavity um doesn't mean you you've got natural bacterial competition then in your oral cavity with um simoncella and all the other natural flora you have so but i think there would be a risk and if it was being shed then i don't stratify it but i think there would be risk of saliva partly yes fantastic thank you um what might be the reasons why there are no peer-reviewed studies on raw meaty oh. bone diet oh, oh, this is on a postcard um, that is well that's actually the question i want to put out to everyone why isn't there been um honest answer because um these studies cost a lot of money um the pet foods manufacturers pour money into research uh, they pour money into vet schools. Um, they pour money into conferences. How many of us have got a raw cannon bag from BSAVA? Okay, we've all got it. Okay. And these companies, I don't think, are going to be in a hurry to sponsor research into... So the question is, who's going to pay for it? Uh, would be number one. Number two, you then need to have um, you know, motivated individuals who are going to be able to collect data without the passion you know, and in and, and the polarized passion that I refer to. I can't believe there aren't people out there to do it. And I would really like there to be, not because I'm a huge proponent of raw meat diets, I, I am worried about them, but because I want us as a profession to come up with answers mm. and exactly where we stand. If there is a paper, you know, I'm an internist who does a lot of gastroenterology. Uh, if I could come up, if someone says, hey, Rob, raw meat diets are going to solve you know, the vast majority of the diarrhea patients you've seen, you, you know, and you don't need to use prednisolone, well, I'm there. You know, I'm yeah. just at that door, um, but I need to know it's safe. Yeah. And I think that's that's the key for me. So um, if anyone wins the lottery on Friday and wants to sponsor, I'm, I'm, I'll happily try to help set the study up. <laughs> I'm going to leave the uh, papers up from Sarah there so everyone can see those. Um, and then another question, what about freeze dried food? Are the similar findings with bacterial shedding? So that's actually, um, okay. Uh, 
Fee, thank you very much for the question. I I don't know is my would be my honest answer. The advantage of freeze drying is you dehydrate the the food to a large degree. Okay. Whereas just freezing, you don't reduce the moisture content to the same degree. And that when you just freeze in the domestic freezer, that at minus 20, that's one of the reasons why bacteria don't all die. When you freeze dry the food, that should just from a basic biological point of view, reduce the bacterial content because you're going to cause um, desiccation of the bacteria potentially as well. So I don't know, and I'm you've caught me that, I don't know of any literature looking at that as a raw you know, freeze-dried food. Certainly something I'll look up and see. I would suspect it's slightly safer if you then handle it appropriately once you rehydrate it. Fantastic. I mean, we're all learning this evening and it's, and it's, you know, there's so much surrounding it, isn't there? Has there been any connection between raw fed and DCM occurrence in dogs? Um, oh, gosh, that's well, I want Nula on the call, isn't it? Uh, or Jack. <laughs> <laughs> or Brigitte. Um, okay, really good question. I'm uh, not consistently no, um, but I, I'm sure there are case reports, yes, um, of dogs who are fed taurine deficient diets and developing DCM. Um but I don't think it's consistent. It, it's theoretically a problem. Um, and I think there are case reports, but I don't know if it's consistent. I will. If Nilla does happen to be listening and pass on a, the answer as well, I'll, I'll feed that on. Um, could the reason dogs fed on commercial diet fit, visit the vet more link back to the fact that owners who feed raw feed diets are more likely to trust their own, you know, um, community their breeders opinion than vets so in general they don't visit the vets frequently kind of swaying those numbers without a doubt and if you look at the discussion of that paper that's one of their there's possible explanations so i've just done the headline figures i think it's a really fair point mm. fantastic um the obesity epidemic in pets is one of our major concerns how do you see raw or vegan fitting into sourcing this out um yeah and also oh, ariel so ariel firstly thanks for the question and i didn't realize a bit three a bit d3 from the algae form that's great news because it you know i think if you choose to feed your dog vegan food i actually understand it um and i i, I actually don't have a problem with vegan food okay in dogs cats i'm slightly worried um look i think the obesity time bomb yes uh pays the mortgage but it's not what how we want to pay our mortgages is it really um and my other major interest in diabetes diabetic cats i think will pay a big chunk of my mortgage over the next 10 years um ultimately the key thing to obesity is feeding um the right number of calories a day relative to that animals exercise and then for making sure they're exercising properly it's the same story as with us and i think it is true that one of the problems of kibble in particular is most owners overfeed you know, I think it's so easy, isn't it? And you think, oh, that's not very much. I look at what, you know, I need to give them a dog some more and then you give treats. So I think if you, um, if the dog is more satisfied by its food and there is evidence both vegan and raw diets satisfy the dogs more, they're probably going to be happier for eating less. And if they eat less, then hope that will lead to less obesity. Um, so I think good vegan diets in particular could help. Raw diets could help if we can make them safe. But I think you can still use good commercially traditional food. If, oh, that's the wrong word, isn't it? Cooked, commercial, dry, wet or kibble. If they are fed that to the right calorie content and exercise the, the patients properly, then they, they shouldn't get overweight unless there's an underlying endocrinopathy. But I think they will play. I think the vegan will play a form, yes. Uh, someone's commented that as far as I know, this cat feeds with synthetic taurine added. Um... That, that is true. Um, what I'm not sure about is how effective synthetic taurine is compared to naturally occurring. Fantastic. That's very helpful. Um, and then the a question about the immune system requiring exposing exposure to pathogens for dogs and humans. All this pathogen research is missing in the point. There's no indication of the illness status of these pets or their owners. Hey, Richard, um, if it's Richard, I know Richard, nice to, thanks for joining and I hope you're okay. Um, that's a really, it's a really fair point. And I, um, 
I think there is now very clear evidence in human medicine that reducing from, from an allergy point of view, um, reducing exposure to um, bacteria and having a super clean house, super clean society is partly responsible or probably made you responsible for the increasing incidence of allergies in, in humans. So I think that's true. And I think the question is that exposure to pathogens, that is true, but um, you could be, it's whether you're exposed to an overwhelming number of pathogenic pathogens, if that's not bad English. So, you know, if you've got um, a fairly non-pathogenic or low virulent um, E. coli, then that's probably not a problem. ESBL E. coli is a problem, okay, because um, you then got to put that on top of the health status of that animal or more wrong the owner. So, you know, you've got those dogs that would be in the pat dogs, you know, and they're going into people that see visit people who are potentially vulnerable, who therefore may not be able to cope. Um, and it's a very complex interrelationship. You're absolutely right. I think that's where the microbiome, uh, you know, our innate immune system within the gut. Um, so I'm not saying pathogens are bad at all. And it may be, maybe that is eventually in 10 years time, we'll say that's why raw food's better, if that's what we think it is. Um, I think there's a careful balance that there are good bugs and bad bugs. And what we want is more good bugs and fewer bad bugs. Fantastic. Well, I think we've covered all of the questions. Thank you, Rob, for so much for going over all of that. Thank you, everyone, for coming along. It's been really nice to have the uh, the discussion. There's lots of thank yous coming through. I think that was a really balanced webinar. Um, I hope everyone that has come along has felt that they've taken something away irrelevant of how you um, choose to feed your pets. I certainly have. And really thank you for your time. Really hope to work with you. Thank you, Rob, for such a brilliant webinar. And we look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Lydia. Thank you.